Blog Talk Radio. And good evening, everybody, and thank you for choosing King Jordan Radio for January 29th, 2015. This is King Jordan you're listening to. Tonight on the show, we're going to be talking about Aaron Hernandez. We're going to be talking about the New England Patriots um, deflect gate, if, uh, if you will. We'll talk about Jody Aris and much, much more. Also, I'd like to promote a wonderful person in Sharon and uh, all you fans of Joey Jackson. I encourage you to go to Joey Jackson Fans on Facebook. That's right. Joey Jackson Fans. Sharon has been doing it for some time, and uh, she is a wonderful shout out to Sharon, Madeline, Paige, all of them. They are wonderful people, and uh, keep up the great work. So uh, we are waiting for Joey to check in. Um... Also, I'd like to give you some information. Follow the show on King Jordan Radio on Facebook, on Twitter, Mr. at Mr. King Jordan. We're going to have Tom Mesero on February 13th, Friday the 13th, at a special time at 11 p.m., 8 p.m. Um, Pacific time. And then the week after that, Thursday at 9.30 Eastern Standard Time, where we will have a triple threat with Beth Karras, Dwayne Cates, and Ann Bremner. Also, one week from today, we will have a life coach, Mary Dubet. Uh, she will uh, go over anything and anything you want to know in the uh, world of social media, um, what to do if somebody dumps you, what to do if in any uh, life situation. To she is a certified life coach. So join us next week as we wait for uh, Joey Jackson to call in. And if you want to hang with us, the number is 347-857-2950. Okay, I believe we do have uh, Mr. Joey Jackson. Ladies and gentlemen, he is a CNN legal analyst. He is also a defense attorney here in New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, making his return from October... The one and only Joey Jackson. Good evening, Joey. How are you? And welcome hey, to King Jordan. Jordan. How how are you? I'm fabulous. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New Year to you. How are you? I, I I always like to say that I'm surviving in a crazy world because the world is ever so crazy. But you know what? There's humanity in it because there's great people out there who are also doing great things. But sometimes you know, these murder trials and everything else get you a little bit jaded, but I have a lot of faith in mankind. So everything is good, George. Yeah, and one of those great people I just uh, mentioned was Sharon, who uh, I just mentioned, the uh, Joey Jackson fan page, does a wonderful job. Is she fabulous or is she fabulous? Uh, she is like not, no other. She's committed. She is just one of, full kind. of generosity and spirit and everything else. And you know, and that's the kind of people she attracts to the page. And, you know, so I owe her a debt of gratitude. Maddie's fabulous, too. There's too many that, Maddie. you know, too many names to mention. But uh, they're all great, you know. And I got we'll to give a shout-out to my Sharon. wife. She's, uh, team Sharon. She, you know, between Maddie, Sharon, my wife, getting the message out there and everything else, it's just a, it's a fabulous group of people. So uh, we're very blessed and fortunate. And then, of course, there's you with your great program. And, uh, you know, covering these many trials and performing the service that you do, keep it up, and may this year be a fabulous year for you and many more thereafter. Well, thank you. And uh, you are making your return from October, but we have a big show coming up this Sunday. Uh, I ask everybody this week, uh, who are you going with? The uh, cheating, I mean, the uh, New England cheaters, <laughs> uh, Patriots, <laughs> or the Seattle Seahawks. <laughs> There's a game on Sunday? What game? Is it really? It's, it's, yeah, it's they think there's about 50 million that tune in. <laughs> That's about it. Listen, I'm telling you, what, one of the reasons I tune in, not only for the game, but, of course, the commercials. I can't wait to see what the commercials are all about. So it should be pretty exciting, a lot of fun. One commercial <laughs> is about uh, abuse of um, 
women, believe it or not. And yeah. with the Ray Rice thing, uh, they somebody took an ad out for that. That should be interesting. But I well, do want to get to... Uh, uh, you know, yeah. but I think it's an important issue. I, it certainly is. Uh, you know, the NFL, uh, it certainly had its share of ups and downs this year, and it had a major down. And I think it's important to shed light on the issue of domestic violence, to you know, speak out about it to let women know that they shouldn't be ashamed, that there are outlets out there to help and support them and, you know, to sort of educate men that it's there's under no circumstance should men be touching women, uh, you know, in any offensive way. Uh, the only, the only, you know, there's, there's just no room for it at all. And so, therefore, I think if the NFL continues to give, give a message out there uh, that speaks out against it, I think we could see some real change. So kudos commercial being out there. I look forward to seeing what it is on Super Bowl Sunday. And who are you going with? Uh, the team that wins. <laughs> oh, you know, that's a very good pick. <laughs> that's a very good pick. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, Jordan. I know you want to get to a lot of the legal issues, but just as an aside, of course, because it is the Super Bowl, the domestic violence issue obviously is important, and it's late gate, and that's deep late gate. But, you know, the, the reality is, is that when I look at the Super Bowl, I see the Patriots, they win all the time, but then the Seahawks are winning all the time. You know, they haven't too. won. You know? <laughs> they haven't won the Super Bowl in, in 10 years. They've been well, to the playoffs every single year. They've been well, winners. That's because, right, in that that's standpoint. because the Giants, uh, you know, the Giants with the helmet catch and when during the perfect season were able to take them out of it. But they have certainly, while they have not won the Super Bowl, they have been in contention. They have put strong teams on the field. They have dominated, you know, the AFC East. And in light of that, you know, I always like to go for the underdog, but there is no underdog. So, uh, You're you know, right. That's what I was just telling somebody. There's nobody to root for. I mean, I, I don't <laughs> like to see I don't see. Oh, okay. I mean, every year there's somebody. Last year I was rooting for Peyton because I wanted to see him get a second ring, and you sort of scored on that game last year. Uh, they only got eight points. But uh, nonetheless, uh, speaking of Patriots, so my Aaron Hernandez trial set to begin. Uh, I want to play this clip to the audience, and I want to get your take on um, the other side. It's uh, Aaron Hernandez, and uh, as I'm waiting for the play clip to uh, load, uh, uh, here it comes. Uh, Aaron Hernandez being charged with murder. Let's uh, take a listen uh, as this uh, clip is coming. Well, Jay, you know, the first thing I did was I I went back to sort of revisit the timeline of things and, and You know, this double homicide was in July of 2012, and about six weeks later, the Patriots had reached a big contract extension with Aaron Hernandez. So I went back and sort of revisited what, you know, what was being said at the time. And and Aaron Hernandez, you know, was talking about how much that contract extension had meant to him and how it was sort of the team and, you know, endorsing him and believing in him. And and he said at the time, and, and he said, I have a lot more to give back and all I can do is play my heart out for them, make the right decisions, and live life as a patriot. That was in August of 2012, and when I think back to it now, what he was saying at the time, about six weeks after this, um, you know, double homicide, it just is remarkable to me to think that that type of stuff was was going on, and, and the team and the contract extension with Hernandez was unfolding shortly thereafter, just uh remarkable to think about those two things in, in confluence there. Mike, as you went back and thought about the timeline, we've learned that there were questions about Hernandez's character that the Patriots had learned of when they were thinking of drafting him out of Florida. It, do you know if there was any new information that they had learned about Hernandez in the time that they had drafted him from the time that they had given him the extension? You know, I don't know that, Jay, and and I would just say this. You know, I don't think they would have given him that contract extension if they had serious concerns at this level. I mean, this is a team that uh, is very thorough uh, on these type of things, and and they wouldn't make that type of investment, uh, in my opinion, if they felt like there was anything even close to this. I really believe, Jay, that this surprised them. In fact, going back, um, you know, to that time when they gave him the contract extension, the owner, Robert Kraft, you know, was talking about how Hernandez made a donation to Robert Kraft's wife's uh, memorial fund of $50,000, and he called it, Jay, one of the most touching moments that he's had as an owner mm. since he owned the team. So I just think 
they were really blindsided by this. I really do believe that. The breaking news is very recent, so we may not have any reaction. But have you heard anything at all from any of the Patriots front office or, or players? Not, not at this time, Jay. I'm actually down here at the stadium uh, as we speak. Uh, they were bringing some of their rookie class out to speak with reporters. Obviously, that becomes secondary. But I'm not expecting uh, to hear anything from the team. But, of the course, if, if they Top do Top of the screen. Anything, the official this far back. 25 yards away. Okay, Joey, a uh, big trial coming up, uh, actually getting ready to get underway. What is your take on this whole Aaron Hernandez situation? You know, it's a big trial, and absolutely is. The only issue I have with the clip is that it, you know, it's presumed guilt. We should presume innocence. I don't know what happened in the double homicide. He's not being tried for the double homicide yet. That is the incident, just for the so the Listeners are clear that the incident in 2012 over the summer, allegedly, where he uh, executed two people after a confrontation in a nightclub. Of course, that happened in Boston also. That's the allegation. That'll be tried after this case. In this particular case, of course, this relates to Odin Lloyd, the semi-professional football player, and that's separate and apart from the double homicide. Uh, that occurred in, on June 17th of 2013. And so, you know, obviously he'll have his day in court. I think that there are very compelling sides uh, that both can make. From a prosecution's perspective, we all know that it's a largely circumstantial case. It's circumstantial in that there is no confession. There is no direct eyewitness who, you know, is coming forward to this point testifying. I mean, there are obviously the other two individuals, Mr. Wallace, a co-defendant, and Mr. Ortiz, a co-defendant, two others who were with Aaron Hernandez at the time in that Nissan Altima at that part. But, uh, you know, there hasn't been an indication yet if they'll come out and testify against him. So based on no eyewitnesses, no confession, no murder weapon, you know, you're left with simply circumstances. And I think from a prosecution's point of view, they're going to argue that those circumstances are compelling. You have Aaron Hernandez texting Mr. Wallace and um, Mr. Ortiz encouraging them to meet up. You have him texting Odin Lloyd saying, hey, are we all going out? Then, of course, you have him renting the Altima, the Nissan Altima renter car. You have him picking up, that is Aaron Hernandez uh, and his other two co-defendants, Wallace uh, and Ortiz. You have him picking up Odin Lloyd at 2.30 a.m. At 3.30 a.m., they leave the industrial park. There's witnesses who hear shots fired, uh, you know, moments before that. They then have, uh, when they're leaving, Odin Lloyd obviously is in the park, and the three of them go. They have surveillance video of Aaron Hernandez in his home carrying what looks to be a gun after this particular yes. murder. And so the prosecution is going to say, look, if it looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, quacks like a duck, what else could it be but a duck? You know, from the defense And what about the, uh, the cleaning? He did a uh, full cleaning of, of his house, not like an ordinary, you know, hire a maid and, you know, for 10 bucks an hour. He did a uh, spring cleaning, I heard, uh, I read, actually, um, to get rid of possible DNA alleged stuff. That's a yeah, that, I, I, I think, Jordan, certainly all of that will come out. Uh, you know, his fiance, that is Aaron Hernandez's fiance, she's a wild card. There's indications that she may have hid, you know, the murder weapon. Who knows what she'll say, if anything. Who knows if she you know, ultimately will testify. Uh, but, you know, the prosecution is going to say that although it's a circumstantial case, the circumstances certainly point to him. And just remember, you know, what circumstantial case is. If we if we go inside and uh, it's dry and then we go back outside and there are puddles on the ground and there are, you know, droplets of moisture on cars, we can reasonably conclude it rains. And so, therefore, you know, without asking a jury to speculate, the jury's going to be allowed to make certain inferences from facts, and the inference will be that he and his co-defendants did it. A couple other things to point out. One is that, you know, it's, it's, it's charged under what they call joint venture uh, liability, and joint venture liability means that you need only be an active participant. The prosecution doesn't have to show that he actually pulled the trigger. The prosecution merely needs to show that he was actively involved and as a result of that, you know, he's guilty. The other thing is, is the prosecution doesn't have to show motive, but certainly the jury is going to be looking for that, and it's going to be a tough haul. Now, I should say from a defense point of view, remember that a lot of evidence was excluded. A lot of evidence was not 
uh, allowed in for the jury to hear, which they won't be hearing. And just so that the listeners know, these this, these things are very important. Number one, we started off right. this conversation by talking about the double homicide. Those jurors are not going to learn anything about his participation or alleged participation in any double homicide. That is Aaron Hernandez. They will not hear that. You may ask, well, why? Wouldn't that be relevant? Well, it might be relevant, but it's also what we call overly prejudicial. And in the event the jurors heard it, they may come to the conclusion that, hey, if he's involved in a double homicide, certainly he did this here. And what we want are jurors who are focused on the current issues and facts and not to presume guilt based upon what you may or may not have done at some previous time. The other thing they won't hear is you might remember uh, his friend Alexander Bradley, who was suing him in federal court, saying he shot him in the eye. That, of course, happened in February of 2013, mere months before this incident happened. The prosecution is not going to be allowed to get any evidence about that. There's also a photograph that they have, the prosecution of Aaron Hernandez with a 45 caliber gun that was taken in 2009. That's not going to be admitted into evidence. Uh, the police also found 45 caliber shells, ammunition, uh, at the residence of Aaron Hernandez. Uh, that will not be coming in as evidence because of a faulty search warrant. And then, of course, text messages involving Odin Lloyd just before he was killed, him texting his sister saying, remember who I'm with. And exactly, that's not coming in. So the, so the defense is, has done its job in terms of getting evidence out, not admissible. Uh, you know, and from the listener's point of view, I know it may seem, you know, unfair. Like, hey, wait a minute, this is information. Why is the jury not allowed to hear it? Well, you always want to have a fair fight, and you don't want to prejudice a defendant, and you want to make what the defendant did or did not do about the facts and circumstances of June 17th of 2013 and nothing else. And so the judge has felt, based upon that, those things being too prejudicial, based upon warrant violations, that they would not come in. And in terms of the text messages that the uh, prosecution tried to get them in under a theory called dying declaration, which is where basically, you know, that's the last dying word that somebody says, but the judge said, hey, that's not a dying declaration. That's merely someone who, that is Odin Lloyd, communicating with his sister. So, Look, the defense has its work cut out for them. And then finally on the defense issue, remember what they went after today. They went after the issue of a sloppy police investigation uh, that was unprofessional. That's what they said in their opening statement today. That is the defense. The second thing they said is that they focused on Aaron Hernandez, the police that is, because of his celebrity status and had blinders on and just went after him, disregarding any and any other thing that possibly could have led to the death. And, of course, they focused on the issue of lack of motive, saying why would this guy who has everything going for him, a beautiful little daughter just won a $40 million contract, why does he want this guy dead? So I think it's going to be a very, very good uh, fight in court, and uh, it's going to really depend upon how the evidence plays out, what people say, how they say it, and how effective the prosecution is, is presenting it and how the effective the defenses in terms of cross-examining and poking holes in testimony. So good trial coming up. Good trial. Uh, no question. Also, uh, we have the uh, Jody Arias that death penalty retrial. Um, let me play this clip for you, and then I want to hear your take on the other side. Sure. Really big developments in the Jody Arias sentencing retrial today. The defense has rested its case. Yeah, we are learning that Jody Arias will not be back on the stand as the prosecution starts its rebuttal. Steve Kraft joins us with more tonight. Steve, is the end in sight? I guess, but it's in the dim distance at this point. But I guess you could say the end is in sight. Arias will not be back on the witness stand. and The prosecutor will not move to strike her testimony given during two days last fall when media and the public were kicked out of the courtroom. And said prosecutors began making their own case, calling their own witnesses. Prosecutor Juan Martinez called Deanna Reed to the witness stand. Travis Alexander dated her before he dated Jody Arias. Deanna Reed explicitly and firmly denied that Travis abused her in any way. The defense made much of a claim from an unnamed witness that Travis threw Deanna down, saying, Get it through your bleeping head. I'm not going to marry you. But Deanna said that never happened. Then, Arias defense attorney Jennifer Wilmot got up to cross-examine Reed based on her earlier statements in a transcript, but Reed refused to answer her questions unless she could hear an audio recording of what she'd said earlier to attorneys during preparations for the trial. At that point, the judge ended court for the day. 
Earlier, Abe Abdelhadi testified for prosecutors. He said he was a higher up in a multi-level marketing company that Travis worked for. Abdelhadi said he met Jody Arias there, went to dinner with her, made out with her, and then they drifted apart. And then Jody got in touch with him a year later, saying she was dating Travis, and had told him about Abe, and Travis was mad. Well, Abdelhadi said he thought this behavior was peculiar. So where do we stand now in this <laughs> tangled odyssey of a trial? Well, it starts up again tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. No trial Thursday due to scheduling difficulties. Back in session next Monday. Okay, Joey, uh, this is uh, the retrial. It's taking almost as long as the original trial. <laughs> what do you make of this uh, second uh, retrial, and uh, where, do you, where do you see it going? I, I make of it that it's very unfortunate. I mean, the Constitution guarantees a couple of things. One thing, of course, is a right to a fair trial, but the other thing is a public trial. And I think the way the fact that the public has been excluded from the trial, the judge right. is making moves to, you know, completely allow the make the public ignorant of anything that goes on under the guise of protecting her rights. I just think it's a little extreme. And as a result of that, you know, it, it's been disjointed. Uh, you know, ha you're going to have Jody Harris testify. You're going to throw everybody out of the courtroom. You know, it's just the way in which it's been run really leads you to wonder Circus. and question just the nature of the system, exactly. And so I think what will ultimately happen is is that after this is done and everything's released, maybe, you know, us in the media will have an opportunity to dissect, uh, you know, the various the issues, the testimony and everything else, and really make an assessment as to exactly what went on in that courtroom because the judge has done has gone out of her way, really, to you know, block access uh, under the guise, again, of protecting a right to a fair trial. But keep in mind that she had a fair trial. She had a trial, and she was determined to be guilty. This is simply to assess whether or not she should be put to death. And I think reasonable minds might agree or disagree about it. But I just think that, you know, that which, that which is done in the dark comes out in the light. So I look forward to the light being shined upon everything, us in the media being able to evaluate the transcripts, the tapes, and everything else, and to just make a good faith assessment as to whether or not she needs, deserves to be put to death. But I think those of us who have seen the trial saw the atrocity she committed against Travis Alexander uh, and really feel terribly for his family that they have to be going through this a second time. It's just a tragedy. Yeah, no question. We have a question from the chat room. Karen Hirsch, uh, witness one lied in a letter he wrote, uh, they want to know, can Juan Martinez file a suit for lying? Well, what happens um, is Karen. it's not so much filing a, a, a suit as much as it is going after people for perjury. You know, the fact is, is that, you know, a court is a place where people can come in and give testimony, but we trust, respect, and rely upon the fact that people are going to testify truthfully. I think one of the big problems people had when the trial was public and we were able to see it the first time around were the various lies that were told primarily from the defendant, Jody Arias herself. I mean, you know, anybody can say anything at any time, and I think that's exactly what she did. Travis beat me. Travis abused me. Travis, you know, my finger, look, at because of this, you know, her family, uh, her father's a bad guy. Her mother's a bad guy. I just think that, you know, it really people were really taken aback by the fact that she just said so many things that was just inconsistent with reality. And so at some point in time, you know, the truth is going to have to prevail. And I just hope that that's sooner rather than later. No question. Uh, let's listen to this final clip, Adam Schefter, about uh, deflate gate, And then we'll get your take on the other side. Our good friend, Adam Schefter. Adam, obviously the world is talking about this press conference. I, I don't know what Tom Brady said. I got no satisfaction out of it. Mm -hmm. What's your take? He didn't look very comfortable up there, that's for sure. He did not seem at ease. Um, he did not have explanations to offer. And I didn't find him as plausible as Bill Belichick, who when he went up there, he went up there with a purpose in mind. He was authoritative. He was definitive. He was to the point. He explained exactly how it worked in his world. With Tom, I think people were left to wonder. Now, again, I also think that this is exactly why it's going to be difficult for the NFL to pin this on somebody. Now, maybe they just find the Patriots. That's certainly possible and take away draft choices. But 
the way I understood it even before these press conferences, and it makes a little bit more sense now, is that they were having a tough time pinning down all the evidence and putting it on a particular person, that it was difficult to do that. Now, again, we know about the balls being deflated, and it's a case where, you know, I think that there were varying levels of the balls being deflated, some not as much as others. I've been told that as well. And they're going through their investigation, which, by the way, has not included speaking to Tom Brady right. as of yet. So how far along could that investigation actually be is a whole separate issue. But I think there are a lot of questions. There are going to continue to be a lot of questions. And I will say this. Look, and we're on in New York, and we're talking in New York. And Jet fans and Giant fans, they would love nothing more than to see that franchise buried into the ground. But the fact of the matter is that if this were the Titans or Jaguars or Steelers or Raiders or Broncos, it, it would not even measure on the Richter scale. But because it's the Patriots, because it's the week before the Super Bowl, because they have their past, and that's a part of this, it becomes a big deal. So I was going to ask you about the uh, Brady not being spoken to yet. How surprised are you that this deep into the process they haven't spoken to him? Well, that that has to tell you that they can't be very deep into the process. Yeah. Right? I mean, how does an investigation without the person at the center of it go on if you haven't spoken to him? I mean, what what is there to learn? To me... Uh, this investigation is centered around Tom Brady, centered around him. And everything else is on the peripheral scene of everything. But the league has not spoken to him until the league does. I, I don't know what can come out of this. Now, again, the beginning of the week I was told that the league could say something about its findings at some point this week. That was possible, but that there would not be anything that was to be expected until after the Super Bowl anyway. So, All right, Joey, uh, what is your take on this uh latest scandal with the New England Patriots, the first one, of course. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. What is my take? I guess I have a couple of takes. You know, look, on the one hand, you certainly expect that in professional sports or anything else, that the playing field is even and that no side does anything by way of cheating to gain a competitive advantage. And so you don't want to see that, particularly when athletes are looked up to by so many and kids respect them and You know, you treat them like they're just deities and you idolize them and then to find out that something like this could happen. Now, we don't know all the precise facts of exactly what went on. We don't know how much Tom Brady was involved, how much he may not have. Was it the ball boy? Was it not? They haven't spoken to him. That'll come out. But, you know, you just want to see in professional sports that people follow the rules, that everybody plays fairly and nicely and the winner wins. At the same time, when you look at the score of the game, you know, 45 to 7, you wonder, well, you know, would it have been 21 to 7 if, it, you know, if the balls weren't in the way that they were? And, you know, the and that's the other side of the equation. Look, the, a football in and of itself doesn't block another player. A football doesn't catch itself and, you know, make a pass. Uh, you know, a football doesn't in and of itself win games without the talented people around them to, to make it happen. But at the end of the day, it's just a disappointment because, again, uh, although I get respect and understand the fact that you still have to go out and execute no matter how many pounds of pressure in the ball, you're going to run the ball, you've got to block your blockers, you've got to catch the ball, you've got to kick the ball. I respect and understand all that. But you just want people to, you know, really be people of their word. A handshake is a handshake. A win is a win. A victory is a victory. And you just never want an asterisk next to it based upon people alleged to have been cheating. And so we'll see what the NFL does. I will say this, Jordan, it's been a heck of a year for the NFL. Let's see what next year brings for them. Boy, oh, oh, my boy. goodness. It's been tough. Yeah. I got two last, uh, two last questions from the chat. Um, Mary sure. writes in, can Joey comment on this ABA standard of conduct of criminal justice response, Jody Harris, why Judge Stevens not fulfilling her obligation under the ABA standard of conduct, obligation to use the court uh, time effectively and fairly? Well, I think it's part of what I was speaking about before. And, you know, there's some out there who do support the judge and feel that, you know, she's doing her job. But at the same time, you know, I get and respect the fact that judges have a responsibility to make sure a defendant has a fair trial. That's important. But at the same time, there are other competing interests. And it's not only about the defendant herself, but what about the victim, the defendant's family, and everybody else? And so, you know, when you look at that, you really wonder, you know, you bending over backwards to the detriment of Travis Alexander, the victim, 
He's the victim here. She's not the victim. Right. He's alive. She's well. He's stabbed to death. He's butchered. His throat is cut. His family's suffering. And so you just have to, you know, there are some judges who would have run things entirely differently and would have allowed her to have a fair trial. I'm certainly, you know, look, as a defense attorney, I absolutely respect, believe, and understand that there needs to be fair trials, but there also needs to be a fair accommodation for victims and their families. And so if it were a little bit more balanced on on that way, uh, I think people would be a lot more, a, a lot more uh, at ease with what has been going on in that courtroom. And Karen wants to know, why did the bishop um, bring a lawyer? The bishop, I think I'm saying it right. hope I'm saying it right. In the uh, well, Joe Yeris case. Well, in any, in any particular proceeding, in the event that, for example, you uh, are at all, there's any issue concerning your testimony, there's any issue concerning implicating yourself, there's any issue concerning perjury, there's any issue concerning lawsuits, there's any issue concerning your personal responsibility, liability, et cetera, you know, anybody is, is entitled uh, to have an attorney present. And so, you know, listen, attorneys uh, for as much as you might say they're, we're great or as much as you might say we're awful, uh, <laughs> what do they say? No one likes attorneys until you actually need one. Uh, yes, <laughs> so, yes. Right? So there's a role to be played there. Uh, but, you know, certainly anybody has the right to retain counsel and to bring counsel for whatever purposes they believe to be appropriate or not appropriate at any proceeding. Okay, we have this one last caller from Virginia. Uh, do you mind if we take it? Not at all. Go Virginia. Okay. Let's go over to 703. Please state your name, and you're on live with Joey Jackson. 703. Hello? Yes. Yes, hi. This is Mary from Virginia. Hi, Joey. Is Mary hi, Mary. Mary. Thanks How for calling. Good, well, thank just, you. I, I also, uh, I already put my question, which you answered, um, that you did expand on, the fact that the judge has to try to make this a, a you know a quick trial not a quick trial but to also think about how the families are being affected how much is taking out their time the finances and everything else it seems like judge stevens is bending over backwards to uh ensure that jody is getting a fair retrial but it seems like she's being retried on the uh verdict rather than the sentencing. Right. I, I get that, Mary. I think that, you know, Judge Stephen, some would argue, has bent over backwards, forwards, sideways, and, you know, contorted like a gymnast to give her a fair trial. And so she certainly has her critics, and I think some people certainly have a point, you know, when it comes to that. Um, you know, the other issue to keep in mind as far as being retried is that since it's a new jury, you know, obviously the new jury has to be brought up to speed on what the issues are, what exactly happened, so that they could make educated choices about whether Jody Ari should be put to death or not. And so that was one of the problems going into the case. How much should we really retry everything so that we allow this jury to know exactly what happened without them having a force to make a decision about guilt, which is already she's been found guilty. There's no question. It's already been found that there's been an aggravated factor of extreme cruelty, which makes her eligible for the death penalty. The only issue is whether she should get death. And so I think the judge, you know, is exercising extreme caution because it's a capital case involving death. But at the same time, you know, again, Mary, I think the issue also is the victims certainly have rights, and the victims' rights need to be respected also, uh, not only the defense and Jody Arias' rights. So I think if there were more of a balance, you know, in respecting the victims' rights, I think, people would uh, have a little bit more faith and trust in the process than they do now. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Have a Thanks. great night. Thanks for calling in. Thanks for the call, and Joey, uh, let's hope for an overtime game Sunday. Uh, that would be interesting. I guess that that would be uh, a win uh, for, for us, I guess, <laughs> you know, if we have an overtime game, because uh, I'm sure you watch plenty of Super Bowls and there were blowouts. Not so much in the last few years, but um, 
the, the, the last exciting, great game was the Giants uh, winning it. And I'm not a Jets fan, just for the record, but that game was just amazing. I don't know what to call it. It was a phenomenal Super Bowl. game. <laughs> it definitely was. <laughs> Listen, Super Bowl Sunday is exciting. It's an important part of who we are, what we do. You know, the fact that we're entertained by professional athletes who are great at their jobs and the fact that we get to watch all those Super Bowl commercials, eat all those chicken wings, have all those chips, <laughs> dip. uh, you know, so let's just have a safe Super Bowl. If people are going to drink, just don't drink and drive and don't drink too much. We have work on Monday, but let's have a great Super Bowl Sunday and you keep doing the great work that you do. It's always my pleasure to join you. It always seems like oh. time's the enemy. We never have enough of it, but uh, I enjoy the time. Yeah, yeah, to the fan for me, and uh, it's been an, uh, my honor to have you on here, as always. The pleasure Thank is mine. Thank you so much, Thank Joey. Thank you so much. Keep up the great work. Okay. See you soon, okay? Be well. Appreciate Thanks. it, Bye-bye. Joey. Appreciate yep. it. Bye-bye. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that was Joey Jackson. Catch him on CNN. Um, in two weeks from today, we will have Beth Terrace. Dwayne Cates, and Ann Bremner. Friday, February the 13th, we will have Tom Mezzarill. That's right, at a special late night time at 11 p.m. East and 8 p.m. Pacific time. So for now, thanks a million to uh, Joey Jackson. He is an awesome guest and an awesome person. And uh, keep up with him. And uh, keep up with the show at King Jordan Radio on uh, Facebook and um, on Twitter at Mr. King Jordan. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll speak to you on Tuesday. If you follow wrestling, you can hear me on Tuesday where we talk about the world of wrestling. Tuesdays at 9. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll speak to you soon. Uh, and just a correction. The ninth. The 13th is Tom Mesereau, and the 19th is Beth Carris, Dwayne Cates, and Ann Bremner. So uh, that's that. Life coach a week from today.